everyone, I am Dr. Sonil Jain from Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. In this series of Forensic Science Lecture, today we are going to learn about fluorescence microscope and electron microscopes. Fluorescence microscope was developed by Kuhns in the year 1941. It is a method of studying material which can be made to fluoresce either in its natural form that is primary or autofluorescence or when treated with chemicals which are capable of fluorescing which is known as secondary fluorescence. The examples of the substances which shows autofluorescence are powdered milk, yeast extract, spinach extract and some naturally occurring substances which shows fluorescence. Fluorescent microscopy is a very important technique in forensics where we are evidences which shows autofluorescence. For example, the biological samples which are found at the crime scene, for example, semen in the cases of rape, etc., that can be visualized under the fluorescence microscope. Many specimens, for example, microminerals, crystals, resins, crude drugs, butter, chlorophyll, vitamins, inorganic compounds, etc., show autofluorescence when irradiated with the UV light. Hettinger developed this technique of sec secondary fluorescence employing fluorochrome stains to stain specific tissue components, bacteria or other pathogens which do not show autofluorescence. So depending upon what kind of substance or evidence which we have found at the crime scene, it can be viewed under the fluorescence microscope. If the substance or the evidence shows autofluorescence, that it can be directly viewed but in cases of evidences which does not show autofluorescence we can use the technique of secondary fluorescence. So the basic task of the fluorescence microscope is to permit excitation light to irradiate the specimen and then to separate the much weaker re-radiating fluorescent light from the brighter excitation light. Whenever the molecules of any substance they goes to the excitation state and they come back to the ground state they emit two type of light one is the excitation light which includes the fluorescent light also thus the emission light reaches the eye or other detector the resulting fluorescing area shine against the dark background which provides the sufficient contrast to permit its detection so, it uses also the molecules which are known, known as fluorochromes. These molecules are capable of fluorescing and are uh, known as fluorescent molecules, fluorescent dyes or fluorochromes. Basically, we use fluorochromes for those evidences or for those objects which does not show autofluorescence. So, if a fluorochrome is conjugated to a large macromolecule, through a chemical reaction or by simply the process of adsorption, the tagged macromolecule is said to contain a fluorophore. For example, DANS is diaminothylosulfonic acid, amino methyl coumarin, AMCA, cascade blue, acridine yellow. All these are the examples of fluorochromes. These chemicals they can be conjugated with any evidence or any substance using a chemical reaction or simply by using the process of adsorption. So whenever we talk about the working of a fluorescence microscope, we talk about the stock shift. The excitation and emission spectra of fluorescent molecules are commonly observed to overlap. The difference in wavelength or energy between the excitation and emitted fluorescent photons is called the Stokes shift. As we can see in the diagram, whenever a molecule gets some energy, absorbs some energy, it goes to the excited state and when it comes back, it emits the same energy. The difference between the absorbance peak and the emission peak is known as the Stokes shift. Now talking about the working of the fluorescence microscope, there is a light source. Through the light source, the light will pass through the excitation filter. 
the excitation filter on the excitation filter the light which has to go through the dichromic mirror to, to which it will go to the objective and from there it will go to the specimen the specimen after receiving the light will go to the excited state and when it comes back to the ground state it will emit some light that emitted light contains some fluorescent light also which will be again go back to the dichromic mirror and then to the ocular and then the detector the detector detects that fluorescent light which is captured and that absorption spectra of that fluorescent light helps us to know that substance which is examined using this microscope so the components of the fluorescence microscope includes light source filters objective lens stage ocular ocular lens and the detector light source of the fluorescence microscopy could be a bright light source for example a mercury or xenon arc lamp which is required because only a narrow band of wavelengths and consequently a small portion of the illuminator output is used to excite the fluorocombs in the specimens so we use for the light source either a mercury lamp or a xenon arc lamp which will excite the fluorocombs which are present in the specimen or the evidence which we are analyzing under the fluorescent microscope then the filters which are being used in the fluorescence microscope are three types of filters one is excitation filters one is emission filter and one is dichroic beam splitter the excitation filters is placed within the illumination path of a fluorescence microscope its purpose is to filter out all wavelengths of the light source except for the excitation range of the fluorophore under inspection because the light which is being given by the light source will comprised of multiple wavelength we just need a particular wavelength light which will excite the fluorochrome of the specimen so the excitation filter will only allow that particular wavelength of light to pass through and it will stop other light at that area then that particular light will go to the specimen that specimen the fluorochromes will be excited after that light and then those rays then will go back to the dichromic mirror and the emission filter so the emission filter is placed within the imaging path of a fluorescence microscope its purpose is to filter out the entire excitation range and to transmit the emission range of the chosen fluorophore <clears throat> then the dichroic filter or beam splitter the dichroic filter or beam splitter is placed between the excitation filter and emission filter at a 45 degree angle its purpose is to reflect the excitation signal towards the fluorophore under inspection and to transmit the emission signal towards the detector so basically now if we learn about the working of a fluorescence microscope firstly there would be a light source where a various range of wavelength of light will be passing through then we have excitation filter the excitation filter uh, uh, will only give or pass the excitation wavelength after the excitation wavelength will pass it will go to the specimen the specimen will radiate the emission or uh, will give the excited emission wavelengths the emission wavelengths will go to the dichroic filter the dichroic filter will pass and will give only the fluorophores to pass through and then the emission filter will stop all the rays and only the fluorescence rays will pass through that would be seen on the detector by the person who is viewing it so apart from that it also comprises of the objective lens and the ocular lens the objective lens is the main microscopic lens which is used to magnify tiny objects or examine minute specimens that are part of larger objects and the ocular lens also known as the eyepiece lens is the part of a compound microscope 
that a user looks to see a magnified image. So, a human lymphocyte is observed giving its autofluorescence under the fluorescence microscope. The forensic applications of fluorescence microscope include the examination of transferred fiber evidence and their comparison, analysis of inks, GSR analysis and confirms the presence of spermatozoa. Then we have the electron microscopes. The electron microscopes are basically which use electron gun as a source. There are two types of microscopes which we use for the analysis of any specimens or objects. One category is optical microscopes and other category are electron microscopes. So, the optical microscopes as the name suggests, they use a simple optical source for the analysis or for the magnification of that specimen. But electron microscope use an electron gun for the analysis of the evidence. So, as we see in the image, the light microscope, the source is light, but for the electron microscope, the source are electrons. In the optical microscope, usually the image is seen by the naked eye directly, but in the cases of electron microscope, the image is viewed on a screen. It is not viewed by the person directly. The electrons which are emitted out, they are, uh, they form an image on the CRT screen and the person views the image on the CRT screen. So, the electron microscopes are type of microscopes that uses a beam of electrons to create an image of the specimen. It is capable of much higher magnification and has a greater resolving power than a light microscope, allowing it to see much smaller objects in finer details. So, as we talk about the magnification power of the optical microscope, they goes to 100x. But in the cases on electron microscopes, the magnification power might go to thousands of x. That means, we can see the specimen about 1000 times magnified than we actually see with the naked eye. So, electron microscopes, there are majorly two main microscopes, one is TEM and one is SEM. TEM is transmission electron microscope and SEM is scanning electron microscope. For the transmission electron microscope, as the name suggests, the rays are transmitted through the specimen. But in the case of scanning electron microscope, the electron gun which passes through the specimen, it scans the area and reflects back the electrons which are being detected by the electron detector and then the image is formed. For the TEM, the specimen which we have put under the microscope should be a very, very thin layer so that the electrons which are being passed through, they can easily transmit it through the specimen. But in the case of scanning electron microscope, the specimens are usually thick. So, in a nutshell, we can say that uh, for the transmission electron microscope, for the thin samples, TEM can be used and for the thick samples, SEM can be used. So, looking at the working of these microscopes, this is how a scanning electron microscopes look. It has a vacuum chamber because which is required for the processing of electronic gun. The early models of SEM were weaker than the many popular models of optical microscopes, but at that time they were capable of resolution of around 20 angstrom compared to sub 50 angstrom resolution of the TEM. But with the decent increase in the technology, improvement in the technology in the last years, the SEM and TEM now can magnify the images up to thousands of x. The principle of SEM, when the accelerated primary electron strikes the sample, it produces secondary electrons. These secondary electrons are collected by a positive charge electron detector, which will give us a three-dimensional image of the sample. So, in the cases of 
tem we will give a, get a 2d image but in case of sem we will give a, get a 3d image tem can be used for a thin section sample sem can be used for the samples which are little bit thicker in nature sem uses a finely focused beam of electrons in order to produce a high resolution image of the sample and it produces a 3d image of the structure of the sample it consists of an electron gun to produce high energy electron beam a magnetic con condensing lenses is used to condense the electron beam and the scanning coil is arranged in between magnetic condensing lens and the sample the electron detector which is also known as scintillator is used to collect the secondary electrons and can be converted into the electronic signal and these signals can be fed into cr oscilloscope which is also known as cro through the video amplifier so the sem has the electron sources on the top then we have anode condenser lenses scan cells objective lens and the sample on the left hand side as you can see the second electron detector which takes up all the secondary electrons and further which results using the pmts it helps in the formation of the image which is being viewed of the sample this is also the scanning electron microscope image where how all parts are integrated in the image this whole instrument is inside a vacuum because the electron gun and other magnetic coils cannot operate at a room temperature and we have to operate and we have to put this system in a vacuum so for the working of a scanning electron microscope the stream of electrons are produced by the electron gun and these primary electrons are accelerated by the grid and anode these accelerated primary electrons are made to be incident on the sample through condensing lenses and the scanning coil high speed primary electrons falling over the sample produces low energy secondary electrons the collection of secondary electrons are very difficult and hence a high voltage is applied to the collector these collected electrons produce scintillations onto the photomultiplier tube are converted into electrical signal these signals are amplified by the video amplifier and then it is fed to the cro by similar procedure the electron beam scans from left to right and the whole picture of the sample is obtained in the cro screen so in the case of electron microscopes the image is seen on the cro screen we can see the firing pin impressions in the center of a 0.45 cartridge using a sem and hair root showing the follicular tag piece of skin which is used to show whether hair was forcibly removed from the scalp follicle or it fall off these are the actual uh, images uh, used taken by the scanning electron microscope the sample preparation of sem requires a lot of work where the metal requires no preparation as they already conduct electricity but the samples which are non metals they need to be prepped with a material known as a sputter coater and a thin layer of conductive material usually gold is acquired using an electric field and argon gas so that a non conductor or non metal becomes useful to analyze under the sem sem uh they require a full vacuum to operate and these devices produces image at weaker resolution but they open up the possibility of examining a whole range of previously untouchable samples crucial for number of different industries and disciplines the sem can be used for various combined with various other techniques like edx energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy which can helps in the analysis and the production of elemental maps representing the distribution of elements within samples it can be used for the analysis of elements mineral orientation morphology and contrast while the sem has been surpassed in power by newer microscope it remains one of the most useful on the market 
and many many areas are using sem and tem for the analysis of various samples in the forensic science the sem is used in various application and it provides variable results for instance in gsr analysis firearm identification investigation of gemstones and jewelry examination of paint particles and fibers filament bulb investigation at traffic accidents handwriting and print examination for forgery counterfeiting bank notes trace comparison examination of non conducting materials high resolution surface imaging so as we talk about sem similarly on the same principles the tem is being based on the major difference between sem and tem as we can see through this image that the light the electron beam gun passes through tem and then the image is formed on the cro so for this we require a very thin slice of sample so that the electron beam can pass through the tem and the image is being formed on the cathode ray image skin screen using transmission electron microscope the components of sem and tem are almost similar for the metals we do not require any sample preparation but for non metals we require fixation and dehydration and embedding the uh, working and uh, working of tem and sem is almost similar forensic aspects of tem is that it is used to view thin specimens tissue sections molecules etc it helps in study of topographical morphological compositional and crystalline information of a sample we can view the samples on molecular level making it possible to study the structure and texture of those samples it is also useful in analyzing and study the crystals and metal structures helps in identification of flaws fractures and damage to even micro size objects so to conclude i would say that microscopes have opened up many doors in science by using this the scientist and students are able to discover the existence of microorganism study various cells it can be used in biological research industrial use microscopes are also used in the field of genetics and without this the mankind would not have been so developed and many diseases would still have no cure thank you